I have decided to break this video up into four different parts due to the extremely long nature of this story. In this video, we will be tackling a series of historically significant events. While we take an extensive dive into the extraordinary circumstances surrounding the Seventh Sword, Psychic Quest for King Arthur's Sword, which is in direct connection with the deeper mystery and story surrounding the Green Stone. The events which took place in this book span over a period of 10 years. All locations and discoveries are documented with verifiable proof. The Mjolnir Stone is repeatedly alluded to as the Green Stone due to its physical appearance, and so I will refer to it as the Green Stone or Mjolnir Stone interchangeably moving forward. The story begins in 1979, following Andrew Collins and fellow colleague and psychic, Graham Phillips, as they both had plans to attend a local gathering that evening at a very popular UFO showcasing, as there would be a large number of people in attendance to discuss the newly found evidence supporting recently reported UFO phenomena. While in attendance, they run into a local UFO enthusiast and colleague by the name of Martin Keatman. During this time, Martin is a young 18-year-old independent UFO researcher and enthusiast, so it was to no surprise of Collins nor Grams when they ran into him there. Shortly afterwards, Martin will go on to introduce them to a mysterious woman by the name of Marion Sunderland. Marion Sunderland was psychic and it would later be identified that her entire family is of high psychical awareness, with all three of her daughters as well as her one son possessing the gift. With this being the case, she was able to instantly pick up on Colin's past. As she begins to attune to Colin's recent life history, she is instantly able to find he has ties with an untrustworthy woman he has been in close association with for a number of years now named Helen. It would seem as though Helen was deeply entrenched with questionable practices as Marion Sunderland was able to pick up on a mysterious occult ritual Helen had intentions of conducting which involved an initiation ceremony with Collins playing as the catalyst for the success of the ritual. The ritual was to be conducted on an obscure island somewhere in the region of Sicily as she would summon the dead spirit of occultist Alistair Crowley as he would attempt to take over Colin's body. The ultimate intentions surrounding the motive behind this are not entirely clear, but it was alluded to that he would eventually attempt to fulfill some sort of lifelong work that he was not able to complete during his lifetime on Earth, involving his twisted prophecies of the things to come following the onset of the new millennium. Given at this time in the story, the events we are speaking of took place in 1979. Shortly after their visit to the Sunderlands, Andrew Collins and Graham Phillips <clears throat> will go back to resuming their independent practices at Collins South London Flat. During one of these meetup sessions, Collins, Graham, and a local boy and supporter of the Strange Phenomena magazine that they were working on, named Stephen Ash, will conduct a hypnotism session in an attempt to uncover any underlying knowledge as to their next plan of action, using Graham's subconscious mind as the catalyst for the session, being as he is a psychic. As Collins puts Graham into a deep and not a trance, a strange female voice, who would claim to be from Graham Phillips' past, as well as claiming to still be alive, will begin speaking through his body. The voice claimed to be a woman by the name of Joanna, and she will go on to reveal the history of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh by the name of Akhenaten, after a quick history lesson, it was revealed to Collins that this pharaoh was significant to the story. The pharaoh Akhenaten is significant to the story because he was the first pharaoh to introduce a monotheistic system into ancient Egypt where there was only the worship of the one true God over the previously held polytheistic system. During that time, the powers that be were very upset with the establishing of this new religious order. And so they had the pharaoh Akhenaten, along with his followers, excommunicate from the land. And that, apparently, this is in close association with the story of Exodus in the Bible, where Moses and the people of the Lord are cast out into the wilderness for 40 years after refusing to conform to the worship of the pagan gods. 
Akhenaten was said to have been the descendant of a separate race of psychogenic psychics who possessed more potent psychical awareness than that of the other Egyptian peoples of that time. And so, after being excommunicated, Akhenaten and his people were split and established themselves in two distinctly different regions of the world. One group traveled to the Midlands of what is today modern-day Britain and were known as the Celtic people or the Celts for short. The other group traveled with Akhenaten to Palestine, which today is known as Israel and from what we know now as the Israelites of the Bible. This story is important because along with them, the Celts brought a powerful magical talisman of immense historical importance, and that at some point in medieval history, this supposed talisman was preserved and kept at a geographical monument located not far from the region in which Colin stays at, being that he lives in Wolverhampton, located in the heart of Britain. For the next several chapters, the spirit of Joanna repeatedly visits Collins by taking on the form of a sub-personality manifested through the subconscious mind of Graham Phillips. It is during these sessions where Joanna goes on to account the history of the magical talisman, and gives detailed descriptions of the different groups and political figures that possessed its potent powers throughout the Middle Ages up until the early modern period. She finally revealed that it was ultimately Collins' responsibility to discover the talisman as it lay hidden somewhere in the Midlands of modern-day Britain. Most important of all, she stated they had only two weeks to find the Mionia Stone, otherwise all hope would be lost in completing this quest. When we look back at Colin's troubling relationship with the woman named Helen, her intentions have finally been revealed. It was revealed by Joanna that the reason Helen was trying to lure Collins off the continent for the Aleister Crowley ceremony was specifically and deliberately to ensure Collins wouldn't be in Britain to find the Meonia Stone in time before it was too late. This further reinforces our suspicions that Helen has bad intentions and may even be possibly working for a secret occult group with opposing interest. One of the individuals suspected of possessing the Mionia Stone during the mid to late 16th century was Humphrey Packington, a member of the Gunpowder Plotters. The Gunpowder Plotters were an underground conspirator group comprising of eight or nine Catholic reformists, who sought to re-establish the governing power of the Roman Catholic Church after a large majority of its supporters had been persecuted and driven underground by the Protestants. These men had been sworn into a pact of secrecy with the ultimate intentions to blow up the House of Parliament on 5 November 1585. Ultimately, the House leaders were tipped off to their plans, and all nine members of the gunpowder plotters were seized, tried and executed. However, Collins and Graham still had to follow the clues left behind by Humphrey Packington, as he was still suspected of possessing the Mionia Stone at some point given that the primary speculation is that Queen Mary of Scots secretly relinquished it to him shortly before her imprisonment, being as she too was a Catholic reformist. After the failure of the gunpowder plotters, Humphrey Packington would become a member of another secret society known as the Nine Worthies, which was set in order to re-establish the power of the Roman Catholic Church. These nine worthies were symbolically represented in the form of various historical figures from Samson in the Bible to King David. The nine worthies were, King Arthur, David, Charlemagne, Godfrey of Boulogne, Julius Caesar, Hector, Joshua, Judah and Alexander the Great. It was because of Humphrey Packington's connection with the nine worthies that he was given the Mionia Stone shortly before Queen Mary's imprisonment. However, Packington was also soon placed under house arrest at a place known as Harvington Hall, where he would spend the next 23 years of his life. It is here, at Harvington Hall, where the men begin conducting their search for any clues on the green stone. After visiting Harvington Hall, they would begin studying the various statues and artwork there depicting the nine worthies and were able to pick out a series of odd synchronicities that would ultimately lead them to a place known as the Knight's Pool. 20 miles from Harvington Hall. This place is significant because if Humphrey Packington really did receive the green stone and had concealed it away not to be discovered by the Inquisition, then this area on the map which also aligned with certain geographical anomalies brought to Collins' attention by the various psychics in close association with him, would prove of some use. On the night of October 23, 1979, Collins and Graham would set out for the night's pool. 
Upon arriving at around 11.30 p.m. they would begin scouring the land surrounding the lake in hopes of finding anything. Humphrey Packington was known to leave subtle clues in his artwork, and by following along a certain path they would eventually come across an old footbridge, connecting two separate landmasses as the footbridge hovered over a narrow stream connecting a smaller body of water to the great lake known as the Knight's Pool. After over an hour of digging and searching, the two men decided that the last place to search would be somewhere near or around the footbridge. Since they already knew the sword was hidden away with the intention of not being found, they had to think outside the box. After lowering themselves to a small muddy platform directly below the footbridge, they begin to meticulously remove each stone block brick comprising of the foundation of the footbridge itself. This effort would prove to not be in vain as they would eventually reveal and unearth an 18-inch long broadsword thought to date back over 400 years ago in Elizabethan era. This discovery finally gave the men the confirmation they needed to know that this bizarre quest was at least not entirely a figment of their imagination. However, they begin to soon panic as they realize that the very existence of this artifact confirms certain claims made by Joanna, the spirit that communicated with Collins through Graham's subconscious mind, and one of the things she had proclaimed was that there was an underground syndicate group of high-level occultist and psychic witches working for a global organization simply known as The Wheel. The Wheel had its own agenda and desire for this quest and it soon dawned on them the possibility of their actions at the Knight's Pool could be currently being monitored by members of this group. So, they hastily make their way to their vehicles to study their find back in the safety of their home. After spending the remainder of the night studying the various inscriptions and artwork on the sword, they would arrange a get-together a few days later at Marion Sunderland's house, with Alan Beard, Terry Stoke, Graham Phillips and Collins in attendance. It must be noted that every individual listed here has some level of acute psychical awareness so the purpose of this get-together was to conduct a group meditational exercise, in the hopes of picking up any further clues as to their next plan of action. This was vitally important because they were swiftly approaching the deadline date in which the green stone was expected to be found or else the trail would go cold and the quest would come to an abrupt end. Although Alan Beard and Marion Sunderland were able to pick up useful imagery involving possibly linked locations, nothing conclusive was produced. That is until the following morning when Marion's daughter, Gaynor, came into direct contact with the broadsword and was instantly flooded with potent imagery and psychic material revolving the history of the sword. It was said that there was some sort of primordial astral guardian which inhabited the sword, and due to reasons not entirely clear, she was able to communicate directly with this entity. We aren't sure why Gaynor of all people, being a 12-year-old girl, was able to attune with the sword so well, but it could be possible that due to her extremely young age, there is a certain level of receptivity and openness still present in her psychological makeup, making it more easy for her to attune. This concludes the end of part one of this three-part series. The next part, part two, will be out in the following weeks to come. I strongly suggest that you guys stay tuned and subscribe, because parts two and three are far more stranger and bizarre. Thank you for watching.